Welcome to the Scientific Sense podcast, where we explore emerging ideas from science, policy, economics, and technology. My name is Gil Epen. We talk with world's leading academics and experts about their recent research or general areas of topical interest. Scientific Sense is an unstructured conversation with no agenda or preparation. We cover a wide variety of domains where new discoveries are made and new technologies are developed on a daily basis. We are most interested in how new ideas affect society and help educate the world how to pursue a rewarding and enjoyable life rooted in science, logic, and information. We seek knowledge without boundaries or constraints and provide unedited content of conversations with researchers and leaders who love what they do. A companion blog to this podcast can be found at scientificsense.com and this podcast is available on over a dozen platforms and directly at scientificsense.net. If you have suggestions for topics, guests, and other ideas, please send them to info at scientificsense.com and I can be reached at gil at epen.info. My guest today is Professor John Dowling, who is Research Professor of Neurosciences at Harvard. His interests include the wiring, physiology, pharmacology, and genetics of the retina, as well as effects of vitamin A and photoreceptors on vision. Welcome, John. Thank you. Delighted to be here. Yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for doing this. So I want to start with one of your older articles entitled Restoring Vision to the Blind, in which you say the notion that restoring vision to the blind is possible uh, has long been uh, thought to be fanciful. However, beginning as far as the 1960s, vision scientists began to investigate the possibility of restoring vision to the blind by activating neurons in the visual pathways beyond the eye, uh, namely the visual cortex. So what is the status of this um, uh, this idea, John, uh, in terms of restoring vision well, to the blind? it's moving along very well, very fast. And indeed, just in the last two years, uh, a gene therapy has been developed for one blinding disease uh, called Labor's amaurosis. And uh, that was a huge breakthrough. Uh, and uh, a wonderful breakthrough. These uh, children who had the disease, it's a, it's a genetic disease, uh, yeah. would begin to show visual defects very early on, in five or six years of age. We know what was going on there. They didn't have the enzyme necessary to convert vitamin A from the form that you eat vitamin A and, and then it gets oxidized slightly to vitamin A aldehyde. And then the vitamin A aldehyde also gets worked on to change its shape. And when its shape is changed, that then allows the vitamin A aldehyde to combine with a protein, which we call opsin, that is uh, in the photoreceptor outer segment. And those are the light sensitive molecules that allow us to start vision. And so when a photon of light hits the photoreceptor, what it does, it, it gets caught by the vitamin A aldehyde. We call it retinal these days. And uh, when the vitamin A aldehyde catches a photon, what it does is it changes the shape of the uh, uh, vitamin A aldehyde to the more common form and it then causes that vitamin A aldehyde to come off the protein. Now, as that happens, as that what we yeah. call isomerization happens, then what occurs in the protein is it begins to undergo a conformational shape change. And the shape change then activates enzymes in the photoreceptor that then activate the photoreceptor and allow us to see. To put in simpler no. terms, if I might, all that light does in the visual process is to cause the shape change of the vitamin A aldehyde or retinol. 
and everything else then goes on thereafter. Yeah, so, but there are different types of blindness, uh, right, John? So, oh. so vitamin A, so what percentage of the blindness that we see today are directly related to a vitamin A related deficiency? Or well, something of course, like that? you know, vitamin A deficiency, or what we now call nutritional night blindness, is a very, very old disease in terms of its being recognized as a problem. Indeed, its first descriptions go way back to the ancient Egyptian papyri, so to about 3500 BC. And when it was recognized that certain people couldn't see well at night, they also had lost daylight vision, but in the day there's enough photons around that even though they lost some visual sensitivity, they still could do very well. But at night they had great deal of difficulty getting around. Well, uh, the story there is that the uh, ancient Egyptians even figured out a way to cure nutritional night blindness. And that is that they fed patients showing these uh, difficulties in seeing at night raw liver, usually from an ox or from some other mammal. And uh, that raw liver would cure them. Why did it cure them? Because in raw liver is where we store vitamin A. Then it was not known that it was vitamin A, but they recognized that there was something that was curative in the raw liver. We now know what that is. Now, it wasn't until the beginning of the 20th century with the discovery of the vitamins that it was recognized what that substance was, and that is vitamin A. And then, of course, in the 20s, 30s, all the way through the first half of the 20th century, the, the understanding of how vitamin A, vitamin A aldehyde, plays an important role in vision as providing that what we call chromophore of the visual pigments, that is the ability of the visual pigments, that protein opsin to capture light became well understood. Okay, so so you uh, let's jump into a recent paper entitled Vitamin A, Its Many Roles, from vision and synaptic plasticity to infant mortality. Um, and so it's not only just vision, it, vitamin A appears to have a broad role to play in many systems. Right? That is absolutely correct. And that's what's happened over the last uh, 50 years or so when it, it, it was first realized, and this was work that I did as a graduate student, that the active role of vitamin A isn't vitamin A itself, whose terminal group is an alcohol, or vitamin A aldehyde, the form of vitamin A that's critical for vision, but vitamin A acid, where the terminal group isn't an alcohol, it isn't an aldehyde, it's an acid. And the, uh, when that was found in, in the uh, early 1960s, then people began to try to figure out what vitamin A acid was doing to maintain the tissues other than vision, other than the photoreceptors. And uh, uh, the breakthrough occurred in about 1987 when two specific receptors for vitamin A acid were discovered. One by a French worker, uh, Pierre Chambon, one by an American worker, Ronald Evans. And they discovered that there were these retinoic acid receptors, RARs. They then found that uh, there was another vitamin A acid receptor called an RXR. And that very often the way retinoic acid acted was to combine with both an RAR and an RXR, and then it exerted its effects. And that sort of broke open the story of how vitamin A affects tissues other than in the photoreceptors. And so at, at what we know at the present time is that there's, there's well over 500 genes that are affected by the, by the retinoic acid receptors. In fact, it's been found that there are various types of retinoic acid receptors, isoforms we call them. So there's RAR, alpha, beta, and gamma. RXR, alpha, beta, and gamma. And uh, so initially, Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, so am I understanding this correctly, uh, John? So vitamin A itself 
uh, is needed for the photoreceptors to function uh, correctly. Uh, but the the, ret uh, the the vitamin A acid, uh, what is it called? The re retinic acid, re retinoic right. acid. Uh, that that has a broader effect on other biological processes, right? So vitamin A itself is is what's uh, what's needed for the eye to function properly. That's correct. But it's not vitamin A itself. It's vitamin A aldehyde. For the other tissues, it's not vitamin A or vitamin A aldehyde, but vitamin A acid. The terminology all got changed about, I guess it was 20, 25 years ago. So we now talk about vitamin A as retinol, the all being that the end group of vitamin A is an alcohol. Vitamin A aldehyde now is known as retinal. The terminal AL means aldehyde and then retinoic acid the acid being the terminal group on the molecule. So much of the molecule is the same as the terminal group that changes. Okay. Yeah, uh, there is a, there's some kind of medication in the market called Retina A or something Retina like a. that for pimples. Is that, is that the same thing? Uh, okay, let me tell you about that story. That's very interesting. <laughs> okay, yeah. uh, the, the studies that we did way back uh, in the 1960s that first identified retinoic acid as critical for the somatic functions of vitamin A. What we showed was that retinoic acid, unlike vitamin A itself or retinol, could not be stored. In other words, to maintain an animal on vitamin A acid, you had to give them a little bit of vitamin A acid every day. On the other hand, we store abundantly vitamin A itself by, by, uh, in the liver. Remember, that was why the eating of raw liver cured vitamin A deficiency, night blindness, way back in the ancient Egyptian time. Okay, yeah. so uh, uh, let's see. All of, <laughs> where did I go all of a sudden? So uh, it had long been known that certain that, um, vitamin A was important for epithelial cells. That is hmm. cells that are turning over all the time. And uh, it was recognized that children with severe acne and even older people with severe acne could be helped with vitamin A. And uh, that was a treatment for acne. But the problem is, is that if you feed too much vitamin A, it can be toxic. And so right. physicians and others, of course, would not, were not able to give very large doses of vitamin A to kids who had severe acne. You often hear that polar bear liver is very toxic. The reason it is, is that it's loaded with vitamin A and only just one mouthful of it can cause real problems. Okay, so uh, when it was discovered that vitamin A acid wasn't stored, but then could maintain all the tissues, then two dermatologists at the University of Pennsylvania said, hey, why don't we use retinoic acid to, to, to cure acne? And that became a rather routine way to deal with acne. And why it was much safer than vitamin A is because vitamin A acid, retinoic acid is not stored. So that was retin A. It does cause some side effects. And so some juveniles can't tolerate that much of it. But for the most part, it's been a very successful treatment for, for uh, uh, acne. But then there was another use that was found for it, probably because yeah. certain mothers uh, tried it to see if they could get rid of a, a little bit of acne on their face. And they noticed that their wrinkles began to disappear. What was going on there was that the retinoic acid was enhancing the uh, turnover of the epithelial cells, which retinoic acid is needed for. And so another preparation became available, retin A again, but with a variety of other uh, names that was used as a wrinkle cream. And it still to this day is used in all preparations. If you look at uh, uh, um, uh, wrinkle creams, almost all of them have some form of vitamin A retinoic acid or what have you in them. So yes, you're right. 
Retin A became important in terms of helping skin conditions, particularly acne, and then secondly, um, in uh, uh, wrinkles. And, and it turns out that people had tried to see if retinoic acid or retinol itself could be helpful in other diseases, including skin cancer, uh, because it was known that vitamin A would affect cells in culture that were cancerous. And so they tried it in a number of clinical trials, almost none of which worked very well, except for one form of leukemia. Promyocytic leukemia, it turns out that retinoic acid is almost a miracle drug for that form of leukemia, whereas it used to be one of the most um, difficult cancers to treat. Today, if you catch it early enough, about 90% of those who receive the vitamin A acid will recover from the leukemia. Yeah, so, so you said, John, um, the body can store vitamin A, but it cannot store the retinoic right. acid. And, and so is, it, is the body converting its stored vitamin A into the necessary retinoic acid or okay. as an acid right. basis? You, you raised an interesting and important point. If yeah. you give somebody vitamin, vitamin A acid, retinoic acid, why doesn't it just convert to, to, uh, to vitamin A? Tissues have a very hard time reducing acids to aldehydes or alcohols, so that vitamin A itself is an alcohol. It can be uh, first slightly oxidized to retinaldehyde, and that is a reversible reaction, so that retinaldehyde can go back to vitamin A. Retinaldehyde then can be oxidized to vitamin A acid, but that's an irreversible reaction. So uh, if you feed someone vitamin A acid, retinoic acid, they cannot convert that back to vitamin A aldehyde or vitamin A. And that's why if you have an animal or a, a, a rat, for example, on a vitamin A deficient diet, you feed him vitamin A acid every day, he stays perfectly healthy. He looks fine for as long as he lives, but he goes blind because he can't reduce the, via, the retinoic acid back to retinaldehyde. Uh, okay, so, so, so uh, talk a little bit about the connection between vitamin A itself and the visual pigments. And the visual pigments? So, yeah. Okay, yeah. well, I told you a little bit about it. That is, the visual pigment yeah. is a molecule consisting of two components, a protein and then the vitamin A aldehyde or retinal. Okay, and the retinal acts as sort of what we call a chromophore. That is, it's what absorbs the light. And when it absorbs the light, it changes its conformation, as I mentioned to you a while ago. And that allows the protein to undergo changes in its shape, in its conformation. That then works in the photoreceptor to activate enzymes that then lead to excitation of the photo photoreceptor cell. A lot of biochemistry is involved. So, so none of this will happen if you're vitamin A deficient, right? None of this could happen. I'm sorry, if uh, I... If, if you're vitamin A deficient, That's right. uh, this process just That's cannot right. happen. That's right, if you're vitamin right? A deficient, you go night blind. That seems to be one of the first changes that occurs in the animal or human being. But then a variety of other things happen as well, not all of which we still understand. We know, for example, vitamin A acid is very important for development, that it's uh, called a morphogen, very important for the patterning of, a, of an embryo. By patterning, I mean that uh, it, it affects genes that are responsible for deciding if this is going to be an arm or a leg or an eye or what have you, okay? So we know that vitamin A acid plays a very important role in development. But beyond BL development, vitamin A acid plays a very important role in the maintenance of various cells, particularly epithelial cells that are turning over all the time. 
In other words, uh, all the time your skin is sloughing off cells and then they're being regenerated deeper in skin so that everything is fine in terms of your skin doesn't seem to change from day to day. When you're on vitamin A deficiency and you can't regenerate the cells, then what happens is that the skin becomes very, very what we call sclerotic. That is, it becomes very rough because you're not generating new cells and uh, it's very unpleasant. But other areas of the body are yeah. also affected, cells of the immune system. It's well known that many of the cells of the immune system are turning over all the time. And in vitamin A deficiency, if there's no retinoic acid being made, many of those cells stop turning over, stop dividing, and that causes a problem. And it's been shown that vitamin A so, acid is critical for bone growth, reproduction, you name it. So, so going back to vision, John, so if uh, blindness caused by, uh, let me ask it differently, is the blindness caused by vitamin A deficiency, is that reversible? Yes, it is to a, yeah, that it is to a certain extent. Um, as long as, okay, let me back up again. I think I've mentioned that in long-term vitamin A deficiency, then what happens is that the photoreceptors themselves degenerate. As long as they don't generate too far, you give back vitamin A and they uh, will recover completely within just a few days to a week. If you allow the vitamin A deficiency to go on too long so that, that the photoreceptor cells lose, particularly the part of the cell where the visual pigment usually is contained, then there's no recovery. So uh, there was a very famous study back in the Second World War, um, in which it, the, it was attempted to map out the effect of vitamin A deficiency on human beings. And what they found was just as I've suggested to you already, that the, the humans did not become night blind until they exhausted their liver stores of vitamin A. When that happened, then the levels of vitamin A in the blood fell very precipitously. And as that happened, then they began to lose their visual pigment in the photoreceptors. And once the, once the pigments are gone, they cannot yeah, be What happens is that it, 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 uh, the pigment first disappears and that causes the human to become less sensitive to light. But then it takes a, a little bit of time for the protein, the opsin protein, to deteriorate. When that deteriorates, that's when you become in, a, in an irreversible situation. In other words, you, you've okay. got to maintain the, the integrity of the photoreceptor, even though it's not nearly as light sensitive as it would be in a normal, because it doesn't have enough vitamin A. But once you lose the protein, that causes the degeneration of the outer segments, and uh, that's when it becomes irreversible. Usually not, not complete so, blindness, but you always end up with a, a, a person who still has a, a decreased visual sensitivity, light sensitivity. Hmm. So it sounds like early detection is important here, right? So if you pick it up early, um, there is some issue with the, with the vision. Uh, it is completely reversible. So what is the status of... Uh, this issue around the world okay. today? Because of something that didn't turn up until the 1970s or so. And it's really largely the work of an ophthalmologist at Johns Hopkins by the name of Alfred Summers. He was asked about, yes. uh, in his first study that was the crucial one by the government of Indonesia to look at the... Um, um, situation with regard to vitamin A deficiency among its poorer people. And when he went to uh, research this, what he discovered was that there was a fair amount of vitamin A deficiency among the poorer people in, in that country. What he found was that, you know, as the summer appeared, usually the night blindness was most prominent in the, in the, in the early spring. And that's because during the winter, of course, there was difficulty 
in getting the foods that have adequate vitamin A in them. So what he found was that by spring, many of the children that were showing night blindness, loss of visual sensitivity, were recovering pretty well. But then when he came back the next year or the year after that, what he found that the number of those children who had been just slightly night blind were disappearing. What, what, what was happening to them? And what he discovered was that many of them were dying for reasons that we still are not quite sure of. In other words, just a, a, a mild vitamin A deficiency increased enormously the mortality for these kids from about six months of age to five years of age. And uh, that is one of the problems that we're still facing today in many parts of the world where vitamin A is not readily available. And uh, 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 in, in, in many parts of the world where fresh vegetables uh, are not obtained uh, or Southeast Asia is a particularly uh, problematic area because of course rice, which is their main staple, doesn't contain much in the way of vitamin A. Now you can make vitamin A capsules these days quite cheaply and you can make them available to people all over the world. But there you run into a political problem and that many uh, people feel if they're being given something that was made in the, in the West, it's going to kill them. And uh, of <laughs> right. course, a few years ago, we thought the problem was going to be solved in a different way in that uh, some scientists in Europe had engineered, genetically engineered a rice that contains carotene. Now carotene is right. the molecule that causes carrots to become yellow, okay? Now, what carotene actually is, is two molecules of vitamin A bound together end to end. So when you eat carrots, and I'm sure everybody listening remembers their mother saying, now eat your carrots because they're good for your vision. And the reason they're good for your vision yeah. is because of the enormous amount of carotene that they contain. Okay, so the, the rice that uh, contained the genes to make carotene was called golden rice. And everybody thought, oh boy, this is going to solve the problem in, East, in Asia, in Southeast Asia. But it turned out that again, mm -hmm. Uh, various groups, including Greenpeace, which I've long admired, fought against it. They said, oh, you shouldn't hmm. you eat anything that's been genetically engineered. So although we've had golden rice for more than 20 years, it's never been fully accepted. Uh, although people are still working <laughs> on getting that acceptance, and hopefully it will happen. But in the meantime... I think it's probably fair to say that hundreds of children have died unnecessarily because of mild vitamin A deficiency. They could have been cured. So what's the, what's the typical cause what of is, death there? Well, that's in, in the uh, children, we don't know. Uh, what is the case yeah. in animals is that the epithelial cells no longer turn over, so they become, uh, um, the, the skin becomes scaly, the other epithelial cells in the intestinal tract, but particularly respiratory tract also are deteriorating. And that allows germs to get in and to cause lung infections or intestinal infections. And that seems to be the major reason that in long-term vitamin A deficiency that people die. But we're not sure that that's the case with these uh, young children who are mildly deficient then they become cured as their diet gets better in the spring and summer, but then they seem to, um, you know, die for reasons that we don't still really understand. I was talking just a year ago to mm -hmm. Dr. Summers about this, and he said, we really still don't know. We know, of course, that vitamin A affects the immune system, and that's not a good thing to have happen. And then, of course, it affects epithelial cells, and he said that maybe even other things that are going on that we still don't know about. So, uh, mm. so, we, so, so we can we can get the data though. I would imagine, right? Um, if 
you know, uh, the, the reason for infant mortality in that area, how they might be dying, is it because of some infection well, or something was, else? Uh, yeah, you know, be, that was yeah. what was thought to be the case. Uh, the reason that yeah. vitamin A, in fact, way back in the 20s, it was called the anti-infective vitamin because it, it was recognized that if you were mildly vitamin A deficiency, that you were much more uh, prone to catching a, a disease. Uh, and so it was assumed that once antibiotics came along and one could deal with infectious diseases, that the loss of life with these young children who had been mildly vitamin A deficiency would go away, but it didn't. So again, we don't know, right. even it, though we understand yes. an enormous it, amount a... about vitamin A and what it does and all sorts of things. We still do not understand the early, you know, the unfortunate mortality of these children that were um, mildly vitamin A deficiency at one time during the year. Yeah, is this a cause of concern for the developed world? Uh, I'm also thinking about, John, um, you know, the, the sort of differences we see in mortality rates in COVID. And if there is a systemic effect on the immune system well, yeah. due to vitamin A deficiency, do you well, see any connections there uh, potentially? No one has suggested that it, that, that is a reason for, in COVID-19, the respiratory problems and the other problems that occur. It's an interesting proposal. I, I, I'm going to ask some of my colleagues in the physician colleagues, if there's been any thinking about this. For the most part, vitamin A deficiency is not a problem in the West. Almost all of us have enough vitamin A in our livers to maintain ourselves for probably a year to two or sometimes even three years. Uh, so I don't think, you know, it's, it's possible that there could be something that the virus is doing that's preventing vitamin A from getting to the appropriate tissues in the lungs or what have you. I have not seen anyone suggest that except you. <laughs> so congratulations. <laughs> I think it's an interesting yeah. idea. But, you know, COVID... Yeah, I mean, you know, like, like you mentioned, if there is uh, potentially respiratory issues and then, you know, some systemic effect on the immune system, there could be some connections there. I want to jump into another section in the paper, uh, John. So neuromodulation and cortical plasticity. Uh, so this is going back to the right. retinoic acid and its effect on yeah. neuromodulation. You well, want to talk a bit about that? that? When that appeared, and it first appeared in the, in, the, uh, in the retina, interestingly enough, and let me develop the story, because uh, most of my career I've spent studying the, uh, the retina of the eye, and the retina is much more than just an array of photoreceptors, and we've been talking mainly about photoreceptors. But the retina is a thin piece of yeah. neural tissue, a true piece of the brain, pushed out into the retina during development. And it consists then not only of the photoreceptors, the most distal elements, but the photoreceptors connect them with two types of neurons, bipolar cells and horizontal cells. Bipolar cells then carry the visual message from the outer retina to the inner retina, where again, two types of neurons are found that uh, are involved in the initial analysis of vision occurring already in the eye. And it's the axons of the third order ganglion cells at the other end of the retina from the photoreceptors that run along the surface of the retina, collect at the optic disc to form the optic nerve. And the optic nerve carries all the visual information from the eye to the rest of the brain. So I've spent much of my career trying to understand the interactions that go on in the retina, the synapses 
between the photoreceptors and the second order cells and what those second order cells do. So for example, yeah. we know that one of the second order cells, the horizontal cell, whose, whose processes are confined to the outer retina are in inhibitory neurons that are involved in shaping uh, your ability to see edges and uh, uh, contrast. Then from the outer retina, the bipolar cells carry the visual message to the inner retina. And there, the two types of cells, amacrine cells, which are confined to the inner retina, and then the ganglion cells that carry the message from the retina to the rest of the brain. The amacrine cells then are involved in more complex processing of visual information. Many of them are motion sensitive. That is that they don't respond very well to a static spot of light, but they will respond very vigorously to um, a flashing light and so on and so forth. And indeed in some animals, even yeah. some of the ganglion cells that uh, reflect the processing that goes on in the inner retina show what we say we call motion uh, direction properties. That is they will respond very well when the light across the retina is going in one direction, but not when it's going in the other direction. Okay. So, uh, of course, the way the photoreceptors activate the second order cells is what they do is they release what we call an excitatory neurotransmitter called L-glutamate, and that activates the horizontal cells and the bipolar cells. Now, the horizontal cells, which are inhibitory, they release at their synapses a different type of neurotransmitter, an inhibitory one, the most common one being gamma amino butyric acid. The names aren't so important. In the inner retina, the same thing. Bipolar cells release glutamate, the excitatory synapse. The amacrine cells then release uh, mainly GABA, but also another inhibitory neurotransmitter, glycine, and so on and so forth. So that's the basic way that excitation and inhibition occurs in the retina. But, and uh, this is something that we got involved with for a long time, they're also released from various neurons, what we call neuromodulatory substances that, that uh, affect the synapses, the junctions between the photoreceptors and the bipolar cells, the horizontal cells and the bipolar cells, the amacrine cells and the ganglion cells and so on and so forth. And uh, <clears throat> The, um, there are substances called monoamines. We seem to play these roles very actively. Dopamine, probably people have heard because it causes various neurological diseases, Parkinson's diseases caused by a lack of dopamine in the brain. And schizophrenia is thought to relate to increased levels of dopamine in the brain. And then depression is related to another monoamine called serotonin and so on and so forth. So we have been in our lab studied particularly the effect of dopamine in the retina. And then one of my postdoctoral fellows wondered whether retinoic acid could possibly play such a role. And he tested it in the retina and found that it did a lot of things that dopamine does. Not everything, but some of the things that dopamine did. And that sort of opened the door to thinking that, gee, <clears throat> something like vitamin A could be playing a role as a neuromodulator. And in the last few years, there's been a group particularly out at Stanford that's been studying the role of retinoic acid in the hippocampus, that region of the, re of the brain that's involved in memory consolidation. That is, if you destroy the hippocampus in an animal or in a human being, what happens is that people can't remember things for more than just a few minutes. They've lost the ability to consolidate memories. And it turns out that retinoic acid seems to be playing a role in that process. And it's been shown that if you destroy certain of the retinoic acid receptors in the hippocampus, it affects the ability of a mouse anyway to learn things and remember things. So that's another whole yep, new yep. story that's still developing on vitamin A. Yeah, it's it's fascinating, John. Um, 
in conclusion, uh, you know, it appears that there is a lot of issues, maybe issues is not the right term, but if we can correct vitamin A deficiency in the developing world, it has a lot of beneficial effects, uh, infant mortality, blindness, um, perhaps variety of CNS diseases may be, uh, may be related. Uh, so a lot of beneficial effects, but there are a lot of resistance to, uh, like you said, the golden rice or other efforts in this direction. So, so what can the world bodies do um, to, to correct this? Well, Is it the World Health know, Organization? Who, who would be yeah, the right, right organization? You know, we're in a this? period now of anti-science. You know, so for example, we're about to have a COVID-19 vaccine. They surveyed people and about 60%, yeah. 50% of the people in some regions, I'm not saying everywhere, say they won't take it. They don't trust it. They think the vaccine is going to hurt them. And, and we're seeing, you know, pockets of resistance to uh, vaccines all around the country. And, and and not always just among the less educated people, but people that are very well educated. I mean, so for example, you know, why after the development of uh, of um, golden rice has there been such resistance by certain groups to to allow it to be uh, promulgated and to prevent vitamin A deficiency in certain regions of the world? I mean, you know, you, you pick up your milk carton <laughs> and very often it'll say no GMO foods, GMO, genetically modified mm. foods. Well, I mean, there's not been one paper that has shown that a genetically modified food causes a problem. Not one. You know, you would expect that there would be one or two, but there isn't. And so why is... Right. Science, you know, at the present time, uh, <laughs> viewed with such suspicion. You know, part of it is, of course, uh, and I don't want to get into politics, <laughs> but we have a president who doesn't <laughs> believe in probably the largest problem facing the world and the planet, and that's climate change. He says it's a hoax. Yeah. Well, no, it is no hoax, folks, <laughs> let me tell you. And we've got to deal with it. And I'm happy to say that the incoming administration, it seems to be willing to attack it. But why is there this anti-science, you know, view? You know, I, I met some science anti-vaccine people, and uh, I say to them, you don't believe in vaccines? Oh, no, they, they're very dangerous. I said, Gee, you know, I had polio when I was 15, and it was two years before the polio vaccine was made available. I said, this polio has been wiped out in this country. Did you take the polio vaccine? Oh, yes, I did. <laughs> but, you know, I said, well, what's that? How is that different from the COVID-19 vaccine or the measles vaccine or any of the others that people are resisting? and are causing problems, including the deaths yeah. of children. Oh, well, I, I feel differently about that. I mean, you know, it's sort of my mind is made up. Don't confuse me with facts. So as a scientist, I get discouraged by the yeah. fact that there is so much anti-science in the world right now and in this country. Okay, I got right, off right. topic here, but and, and like you suggested I'll get off my soapbox now. No, no. So, so like you suggested, John, though, it's not necessarily education. That's right. It's not. Right. So, um, so going back to, you know, uh, what, what is the, what is the solution? Um, it appears that, uh, you know, there is no sort of hypothesis testing. So it's not necessarily education. It's a process that people have to learn, uh, you know, to, to look at information. Right, you you don't need a master's degree to do this. You just need a process by which you say if there is a hypothesis. You need to get some data. You need to test it, and then you need to reach a conclusion rather than base a conclusion based on just opinion or exactly. feeling. Yeah, right? and that's 
Yeah, uh, and you know yeah. why people uh, won't accept that. You know, I think you know the F, we are, we have regulatory agencies in this country that I think do a terrific job. The FDA, for example, with, with which is now looking at the two vaccines that have been so far developed. And they're going to look very carefully to see if it's safe for people. Now, we're all different. I think this is worthwhile saying. So something that you take, you know, you it may be fine for you, but for me it could cause a problem. And so on and so forth. I mean, so for example, I'll give you an, a, a, one in my own family, and that is my wife had a, a urinary tract infection. And uh, when she went to the doctor who found that there wasn't any good antibiotic that would, would help her, suggested that she try sulfur drugs, which are considered very safe, have been used since the 1930s to get rid of particularly difficult bacteria. And he gave it to her. She's not someone who is allergic to things, but for her, it caused what is called an anemia. Her white blood cell levels began to fall precipitously. And if you look at the statistics, something in the order of 10 to 20% of the people who have that anemia die. Well, of course, you know, she didn't die. She recovered and all the rest of it. But that's an example of where what is considered to be a very drug, you know, very safe drug that was given to her to solve a problem that was not a very pleasant problem for her can cause an, a big problem. But you don't throw the bathwater out with the baby. And, and that's what I think is going on too much in this country and elsewhere in the world. Uh, you know, okay, so how do we... Persuade the people. No, yeah, listen. you might have a bad reaction, but the chances are very, very tiny. Yeah, yeah it is. It is actually that's a very important point, John. You know, people don't derive a lot of comfort from statistics, yeah. right? And so, so if you see a side effect uh, that you know, very, very bad side effect. Uh, and even though uh, the chance of that happening is minute, uh, you sort of internalize that as a possibility. Um, I can see that for drugs, but uh, going back to your vaccination uh, issue, we don't know of too many people. <laughs> I don't know if there's anybody who's dying from, let's say, flu vaccine, right? They might still get the flu, um, but nobody's dying from taking a vaccine. So that is why uh, I don't really get this idea of a vaccine resistance, because again, we have almost nobody dying from it, right? I mean, I can see, you know, taking certain types of drugs, small probability of severe adverse reactions, but that's not the no, case for no, vaccines. I think you're right. right? Uh, let me just mention something else. I think there have probably been more unfortunate situations with vaccines than there have been with genetically modified foods. And yet you have a group of people who say this is very dangerous and don't ever eat them. And people are selling their products saying, oh, we don't use any genetically modified foods. And yet, you know, as our population on this planet increases, it's going to be genet genetically modified foods that are going to enable us to feed everybody. And there are too many people going to bed hungry in this world that could be at least partially helped if there wasn't such this anti-scientific um, attitude about using genetically modified foods. I mean, it, yeah, it's I, a different topic. Yeah. You know, uh, I sometimes, you know, I sometimes think about, you know, we have fluoride oh, I, in the water. Yeah, I, I went through and... that argument. I mean, <laughs> when I was small and my dentist wanted to put chlorofluoride on my teeth, my father was a physician, said, sure, of yeah. course, if it'll help. And then, of course, they started putting in drinking water. And as far as I know, it never caused a problem, yet it, it essentially wiped out a lot of cavities. 
No question about it. Is, uh, is vitamin A water no, it's, soluble? It's uh, fat soluble. There are two types of vitamins. Let's go back to the, <laughs> the topic of the day. And that is, <laughs> you know, when the vitamins were discovered, uh, it was realized quickly that there were two yeah. basic kinds. There were those that were uh, fat soluble, and that included vitamin A and vitamin D, and those that were water soluble, the B vitamins and vitamin C. And now there are many more vitamins, and, mm. but you can still put them into one area or the other. But as far as vitamin A is concerned, uh, it, it, is, it, it requires a, a fat, a, an oil essentially to dissolve it. Probably there are people listening who remember getting their vitamin A from cod liver oil. You're probably too young for that, <laughs> yeah, but that was right. where I got my early vitamin A. Now, vitamin A has since been synthesized, yeah. and so it, it's now uh, all made in the laboratory and uh, put in a pill, and that's perfectly good vitamin A. Uh, but, and, uh, right, and, right. and so no one has to suffer through vitamin A uh, application through cod liver oil, which always was not very pleasant when you were five or six years of age. <laughs> right, yeah. I just hope, John, in conclusion, you know, I just hope that um, we get world organizations to come together to disseminate scientific information uh, across the world. And, and part of that is um, developing a trust, right, um, around the world population so that people don't look at things as Western generated or Eastern generated or whatever the case may be. Um, it's really d information dissemination that needs to be there sure. uh, for the entire world. And the question yeah, is, who well, I mean, you know, again, every country does it a little differently. We have some marvelous organizations, agencies, the FDA for one, which looks very carefully at anything that's going to be released to the public, like it's doing with the vaccines now. And it won't allow it if it feels that it's, that it's unsafe in any sense of the word. But that doesn't mean that, that everybody who takes it won't have some reaction. For the most part, they're going to be very minor. Right. You, you probably get feel the little prick of the needle more than anything else that happens thereafter. And if you're protected against the COVID-19, what a, what a phenomenal thing that will be. And it holds for the other vaccines that are available. We don't give things to people that cause problems. That's what the FDA is, you know, that's their job and they do a very good job of it. Right, right. Excellent. Um, this has been great, John. Thanks so much. Okay, for I, hope, with me. I hope it was intelligible. I enjoyed chatting with you, Gil. And uh, good luck. And uh, Thanks so keep much. our fingers crossed that people accept Stay the safe. vaccine and that we move on from this pandemic. Very I good. So. This is a Scientific Sense podcast providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info at scientificsense.com.